Welcome to Ms. Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 10 things Catch Me If You Can got factually right and wrong. You have really nice teeth. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and you have a pretty smile. <laughs> You're the best damn pilot in the sky. It's not what you think, I'm just a co-pilot. You mind telling us what the hell you're talking about? For this list, we'll be comparing the 2002 film and the true story of conman Frank Abagnale Jr. It's no trick to say that this list will contain spoilers. Which of Abagnale's scams most blows your mind? Let us know in the comments. Number 10. Working with the FBI. Right. Frank, would you be interested in working with the FBI's financial crimes unit? In the film, after Frank gets out of prison, he goes to work for the FBI to help them catch other check forgers. Is that the truth, Frank? Is that the truth? This is actually true. Abagnale was paroled early from his 12-year sentence on the condition that he helped the FBI. I mean, how long? Every day. Every day, Frank, till we let you go. It's also true that in doing so, he worked closely with the same agent who had chased him for years. We'll learn more about him later. Today, Abagnale is a security consultant and lectures at the FBI Academy and field offices. Number nine, Frank and Carl remaining friends. Right. As the camera slowly pans out at the end of the film, the audience is presented with a number of informational title cards, one of which says that Frank and Carl remain close friends to this day. Most people find it hard to stay friends with an ex, let alone the man that captured you or the criminal that you captured. Don't worry, Frank. I'll have you extradited back to the United States. Don't worry. But in this case, it's true. Frank and the FBI agent who caught him, whose real name was actually Joseph Shea, remained close friends until the agent's death in 2005 at the age of 85. Number eight, escaping through the airplane toilet. Wrong. Oh. Oh. Frank! Frank! In the film, when Frank is being deported back to the States by the FBI, he's told that his father has passed away. I didn't want to say anything until he got closer to home. He, he fell down some steps at Grand Central Station trying to catch a train. This sends him into a state of despair, and he runs to the airplane washroom, making his escape through the toilet. He then rushes back to his childhood home to see his mother. While this definitely makes for an emotional Hollywood movie moment, almost none of it is true. Frank did escape from the airplane, but through the kitchen galley. Also, he didn't go home afterwards. He was eventually reapprehended at the airport in Montreal, Canada, while waiting to purchase a ticket to Brazil. The car. Get me in the car, please. Get me in the car. Number seven, Carl Hanratty. Wrong. Hey! Oh, God damn it! Part of what makes Catch Me If You Can such an engaging and exciting film is the cat and mouse game between FBI agent Carl Hanratty and on the run conman Frank Abagnale Jr. You mind telling us what the hell you're talking about? However, the truth is a little different. For starters, there were many FBI agents after Frank during his criminal years. However, there was one agent who is often credited as the main force on the case and most responsible with capturing Frank. That's right. I think it's just me and you, and you know what? You're gonna have to catch me yourself. As we said, his name was Joseph Shea. However, his name was changed because Shea didn't want his name used in the film. Number six, being an only child. Wrong. Plot-wise, the chase is what Catch Me If You Can is all about. But it's family that's at the emotional heart of the film and what drives our hero in several key moments. Your father and I are getting a divorce. Ne t'inquiète pas, je suis là. Nothing's gonna change. We're still gonna see each other. Stop it. And as we'll see throughout this list, it's these family aspects of the film that were the most changed from real life, including Frank being portrayed as an only child. There's 50 checks there, Frank. Which means, from this day on, you're in that little club. I'm in that little club. Maybe Steven Spielberg, who directed the film, and screenwriter Jeff Nathanson felt that siblings would detract from the story. But the truth is that Frank had two brothers and a sister. My son bought me a Cadillac today. I think that calls for a toast. Number five, FBI's most wanted list. Wrong. There is no doubting the fact that Frank Abagnale was one of the most wanted criminals in the world. Wait, I'm sure we can take care of that. I'm working part-time at the church now. Just tell me how much he owes and I'll pay you back. So far, it's about $1.3 million. 
But was he actually ever on the FBI's most wanted list? In the movie, he is. However, the truth is that Frank never actually made the list. Not because the FBI didn't want him. They most definitely did. Hey, you mind taking that gun out of my face? Please, really. I mean, it makes me nervous. But because the list, which made its debut back in 1950, was reserved for violent criminals only. So Frank's white-collar crimes would not have put him on the iconic list. Please, don't come to my home and call my boy a criminal because that Never kid said is he was a criminal, guts. Mr. Abagnale. Number four, almost getting married. Wrong. Another big moment in the film comes when Frank meets nurse Brenda, played by Amy Adams. You have really nice teeth. Well, thank you. And you have a pretty smile. <laughs> no, I mean it. I really think those braces look good on you. Frank falls for her, and in an effort to settle down and stop running, he proposes. What if I went to your parents and I spoke to your father? And I asked permission to marry you. However, when the authorities start to close in, Frank confesses everything to Brenda and asks her to run away with him. Brenda, we can live anywhere we want. We have to trust me, Brenda. Do you trust me? Yeah. Do, do you love me, Brenda? You love me. I love you. As it turns out, the relationship was slightly exaggerated. According to Frank, quote, the character of Brenda Strong is based on an Eastern Airlines flight attendant I dated while living in Louisiana, which fit into the story Spielberg wanted to tell about my life between the ages of 16 and 21. We were never engaged, as I was too young to even think about that. Please, please, before you go, please tell me your name. Please tell me. Frank. Number three, Frank Sr. Wrong. So please stand as I present my very good friend, the man who keeps our pencils sharp <laughs> and our pens in ink, Frank William Avignale. And here we are again with yet another family-themed entry. A key driving force for Frank in the film is his relationship with his father. He initially runs away from home after his parents divorced. In an interview with IGN, Steven Spielberg said that he, quote, wanted to continue to have that connection where Frank kept trying to please his father by making him proud of him, by seeing him in the uniform, the Pan American uniform. You're the best damn pilot in the sky. It's not what you think, I'm just a co-pilot. And that continued connection and the risks Frank takes to see his dad definitely add emotional weight to the story. The problem is that, in reality, Frank never saw his dad again after he ran away from home. Frank. One ticket to Grand Central, please. That'll be three dollars and fifty cents, sir. Is it okay if I write you a check? Number two, conning an escort. Right. Haven't I seen you before? Maybe. Jennifer Garner's role as escort Cheryl Ann in Catch Me If You Can is brief but memorable. Meeting Frank at a Manhattan hotel, Cheryl informs Frank that a night with her will cost him a thousand dollars. Okay. A thousand dollars. Okay. I'll be right back. <laughs> Wait a second, where are you going? I'm going downstairs to cash a check. Little does she know that Frank is gonna screw her before they even get into bed. Abagnale pays her with a fake $1,400 check, and she gives him $400 in cash. Even better. So, how true is this interaction? Well, the events occurred in Miami, not New York. But the basic scam is all true. In fact, to quote from Abagnale's book, quote, Several days later, when her bank informed her the cashier's check was a counterfeit, she called the Dade County Sheriff's Department. Furious. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number one, the scams. Right. Do you know if they're hiring here at the hospital? I'm not sure. What do you want to do? I'm a doctor say that truth is stranger than fiction. And that is definitely the case when it comes to the scams portrayed in the film. At the end of the day, I'll be choosing eight young ladies to be a part of Pan Am's future stewardess flight crew program. As the real Frank Abagnale said in November 2001 before the film's release, quote, 
Steven Spielberg has told the screenplay writer, Jeff Nathanson, that he wants complete accuracy in the relationships and actual scams that I perpetrated. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, this is irrefutable evidence that the defendant is in fact lying. And although there were a few little changes made, for the most part, Spielberg got what he wanted. Just like in the movie, Abagnale did impersonate an airplane pilot and deadhead on flights. He did create a law degree and then pass the Louisiana bar. And he did impersonate a doctor. Do you agree with our picks? Check out this other recent clip from Ms. Mojo. And be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.